Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host, with another marvellous video. George R. R. Martin is a guy who loves grey characters. His most beloved creation is a dwarf who's actually not as concerned with peace as his HBO counterpart was towards the end. His most inspiring warrior fell prey to his own honour and the vices of youth, which culminated in the Red Wedding. Heck, Melisandre, who was universally considered to be a hateful witch, became sympathetic after Martin gave her a POV chapter and called her deeply misunderstood in an interview. But the most apparent example of his love for creating grey characters is undoubtedly Prince Daemon Targaryen. A rogue, if there ever was one, is how Martin describes him, and after having seen House of the Dragon, we think we know why he's George's favourite Targaryen of all time. Yeah, even more than Denny. So, without further ado, this is the origins of the rogue Prince Daemon Targaryen explored. Oh, and spoiler warning, because there will be a lot of those in this video. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. His name is ancient and ominous, Daemon Targaryen's heritage and history. In the year 170 AC, Princess Daena Targaryen gave birth to a bastard boy in the Maiden Vault whose paternity was a matter of great concern, but so was his name. Daena the Defiant called her boy Daemon after her grandsire the Rogue Prince, but instead of celebrating, the naming men called it a grave omen. Their concerns would be well founded because this Daemon would later be bestowed with the ancestral Valyrian longsword of House Targaryen, Blackfire, and also be legitimized as one of King Aegon the Unworthy's great bastards. After taking his sword's name for his own house, Daemon started a rebellion that lasted for five generations and arguably gave Westeros more sleepless nights than the Dance of the Dragons itself. The Black Fire pretenders plagued the realm for over six decades, and there are hints in the main story that they may not be done with the Seven Kingdoms yet. But you can see why the naming of his bastard boy who bore a king's sword is so important, and the legacy associated with that name is not something only the Rogue Prince contributed to. The name Daemon itself is not one that House Targaryen is usually associated with. In the records of the Dragonlord family kept during the Century of Blood, the only thing close to this name is a Lord Damien Targaryen, who was the grandfather of Aegon. On, the Conqueror. The name Daemon is actually far more commonly observed in the Targaryen's closest allies and near kin. House Valerian. The first Daemon to be named in Westerosi histories was kin to Aegon the Conqueror and his mother as well. He was one of the closest friends and allies that the Targaryens had before the conquest, and his family had grown rich off of the trade that came into the gullet and past Driftmark to get to Duskendale. Daemon Valerian was one of the first lords that Aegon summoned to Dragonstone to plot his conquest, and he was also one of the first lords to swear a bison to him. It was Daemon's ships that carried Aegon's forces to the mouth of the Blackwater Rush, and when the Dragon King took his crown, he he named his fast friend the first master of ships of the Seven Kingdoms. As the admiral of the royal fleet, Daemon Valerian could not give himself a moment's rest. There was a war to win, and it had only just begun. Egan dispatched his fleet under the command of Lord Daemon and sent his sister Visenya upon Vagar to attack Gulltown in the Vale. But Lord Daemon died in the battle off the waters and was succeeded by his son Aethon as Lord of the Tides. It would be his grandson whose name would be remembered more reverently by the histories. Daemon Valerian was the son of Lord Aethon Valerian and Lady Alara Massey, and the grandson of the Daemon we just spoke of. Before the Sea Snake solidified his house's legacy with his nine voyages, it was Lord Daemon who strived to preserve the status of House Valerian as the second house of the realm. His sister Elisa was married to Aegon the Conqueror's eldest son and heir, Ennis, and Daemon grew up a proud man who wished to protect his ancient family's legacy at all costs. Perhaps that was the reason that he joined Magor the Cruel Small Council as Master of Ships, though there is something to be said about the convincing power of dragons. When Daemon's sister, Elisa, fled Dragonstone for Driftmark upon Magor's return from exile, he gave her shelter and allowed her to declare her eldest son Aegon's claim from their ancestral seat. Wisenya Targaryen ensured the Dowager Queen's cooperation with her son's plans by personally visiting the Valerians with Vagar and convincing them to bend the knee. Daemon was present for Magor's wedding to Tiana of the Tower, and even advised the king to take his niece Rhaena as his next bride, as he would unite the rival branches of House Targaryen by doing so. Many think this is a cruel betrayal of his sister Elisa's trust, but surely Lord Daemon was malicious to serve up his own niece to Magor the Cruel, but it is possible that there was a larger conspiracy at work here. Magor's reign was pockmarked by rebellions and battles aplenty, so much so that the king was almost always off to war. 
The result of his tyranny was that the men of his own city didn't trust his rule, and it appears as though Lord Daemon might have been one of them. When Wisenia Targaryen died in 44 AC, Alyssa immediately fled Dragonstone with Dark Sister and her children Jaehaerys and Alysanne. It is thought that she took ship for the free cities and stayed in exile for four years till she resurfaced at Storm's End in 48 AC. But if she did take a ship to flee into exile, then it only makes sense that her brother would have been involved. As master of ships, Daemon had intimate knowledge of the naval routes of the known world and of the men and ships that traversed them. He could have helped his sister take off while he laid the ground for Magor's downfall. Rhaenor was married to Magor in 47 AC alongside Eleanor Costain and Jane Westerling in a triple ceremony. It is said that she tried to kill her husband on their wedding night with a dagger hidden underneath her pillow. It's possible that this dagger was delivered there by Daemon himself, though many doubt the story in the first place. Daemon's thinking when he proposed Rhaenor as Magor's next bride was also not malicious but rather peaceful, as he wanted to prevent more war and bloodshed in a kingdom already torn asunder by it. It would also have been easier for him to ensure his niece's safety in King's Landing, where he could reach her with his ships, instead of Fair Isle, which lay all the way across in the Sunset Sea. And it also appears as though he was complicit in his niece's escape from Magor's Holdfast a year later, for it was in 48 AC that the tides turned against the cruel king. Damon's sister returned to the Seven Kingdoms with her son Jaehaerys and daughter Alysanne. The former made his claim to the Iron Throne known to the Lords High and Low from Storm's End, and Rogar Baratheon became his very first supporter. The second was Daemon Valerian. When Rhaenor learned of her brother's intention to claim their father's rightful seat, she escaped the Red Keep with her daughter, Araya, and Magor's sword, Blackfire, giving Jaehaerys both of the ancestral swords of his house, Magor's declared heir, and Dreamfire support in battle. Though we're never told how she managed to pull off any of this, we can assume now that Daemon Valerian must have been implicit in the same, for he announced his support for Jaehaerys soon after. With him went the Valerian fleet, and since it was the royal fleet as well, Magor no longer had strength at sea, though it would appear as though fate had already decided that he didn't need it anymore. Magor the Cruel was found dead on the Iron Throne by Queen Eleanor Costain, and Jaehaerys affirmed Daemon Valerian in his position as Master of Ships after his ascension. He also accepted a position as one of Jaehaerys' regents under hand of the king Rogar Baratheon and queen regent Elisa Valerian, but it is here that we saw Daemon's true pride emerge once again. When the regents were discussing the matter of Jaehaerys' marriage, Daemon argued in favor of Eleanor Costain, one of Magor's black brides. His logic was not fallible. Magor's realm had been a cruel one, yet many still clung to his cruel ways and might have supported him in their hearts. Marrying Eleanor would quell any possible loyalist movements, and the Queen's fertility was also a point in her favor. Magor's cruelty might have been extended over generations had he become a father, but mercifully, he never did. Lady Eleanor did have three sons from her previous marriage, and Damon even suggested that Jaehaerys adopt them to secure the succession, but the king chose to wed for love in the end, and it's possible that Damon Valerian encouraged it. Rogal Baratheon believed that Damon was the one who had alerted Alysanne about his decision to marry her to his brother Orin to preserve the status of House Valerian as the second house of the realm. His fears were stoked when Damon's sons took Jaehaerys and Alysanne to inspect the shipyards at Driftmark, and when he later refused the Hand's request of using the Valerian fleet against those who sought to carry favor with the king, responding with a blunt no. Damon was the foremost voice against Rogar's plot to crown Araya Targaryen, and after he was dismissed as Hand for speaking such treason, Damon rose to that post himself. As Hand, it is said, he spoke little and did lesser, but perhaps that was for the best. Damon allowed his king's word to take precedence over his own, which is the mark of a truly leal advisor. He spent four years as Hand, even after Jaehaerys had taken the throne upon his majority, and only departed from King's Landing when he could no longer stomach grief. His niece, Lyanna Valerian, died at Dragonstone at the hands of Andro Farman, though it was believed to be a disease at the time. Damon grieved even as he sent his galleys to the island fortress to prevent the spread of said disease to other lands. After it was discovered that Lyanna had been murdered instead, Damon declared he wanted to spend more time with his family and resigned as Hand. Some believed that it was because of his rivalry with the new master of ships, Manfred Redwine, but this has never been proven. The rest of his life was spent battling disease and grieving his dead for all of his sons passed away before him. When Damon died at the age of 88, he was succeeded by his grandson Corlys, 
who carried on his prideful legacy of seeing the Valerians as the second house of Westeros and had kingly ambitions of his own. But before he passed away, the sheer stubbornness and roguery associated with his person had already passed on to someone else of his own kin, though he was a few generations removed from himself and was born on the dragon-riding side of the sheets. He was the second son of a second son, Prince Daemon Targaryen's birth and early years. Daemon Valerian was remembered for his passionate defense of his family's status within the realm. This legacy of his would be passed on to the next person to come into the world bearing his name, though his own life would be reflected upon with opposing lenses. Archmaester Gildane writes in Fire and Blood that Daemon Targaryen was equal parts light and darkness. We'd like to think he was just a man of action, frustrated by the inaction that his station demanded. He was born the second son of a second son, you see, but his own position within the realm was unique, for he was only the second plausible male heir to the Iron Throne, after his own elder brother, Viserys. As a consequence, Daemon Targaryen was not only aware of the fact that he would have to carve out his legacy by his own hand, but he was also willing to act upon it. He was born in 81 AC to Princess Elisa Targaryen and Prince Balon. Targaryen, the proverbial spare to King Jaehaerys' succession. Within a fortnight of his birth, his mother strapped him to her chest with his swaddling clothes and took him for a flight on Melis, the Red Queen. It would seem as though he would be the one to take most after his own parents, as his brother Viserys grew into a peace-loving, open-handed monarch where Daemon is described as always having been free-spirited and adventurous. Alyssa Targaryen was a wild princess who will have reminded you of Arya Stark had her story been the focus of House of the Dragon and Prince Balon the Brave had smacked Beleriand the Black Dread on his snout before he reached the age of three. Little wonder then that the son of such willful parents would be a free spirit himself. It would appear as though Daemon was named after the very Daemon Valerian we discussed earlier in this video, because his mother Elisa was named after his great-grandmother, and his brother Viserys was named after his grand-uncle. Daemon Valerian would have been his great-great-uncle by that metric, so it makes sense that Elisa would have named her son after him. Though we have no knowledge of the childhood of Princes Viserys and Daemon, we can assume it wasn't quite as warm as the one their father shared with his own brother Aemon. For starters, Viserys was described as plump and fond of pomp even before he became king, indicating that he never had a martial nature. Aemon and Balin had grown up training at arms together, which is what deepened their bond so much. In this regard, Daemon took after his father and uncle, for he grew into one of the best warriors in the realm. He was skilled at hunting, jousting, and swordplay, indicating prowess with bow, lance, and sword and shield. We don't know who trained Daemon for the identity of the master at arms of the Red Keep during this era is lost to history, but it is possible that Daemon was trained by the legendary Sir Ryan Redwine himself, who was a member of the Kingsguard by this point. It was not unheard of for the Kingsguard, the finest knights in the Seven Kingdoms, to help train royal princes in the arts of war and combat. And if this assumption is true, then Damon learnt from the cream of the crop. It could also have been Sir Clement Crabbe, Sir Robinshaw, or any other member of Jaehaerys' Kingsguard towards the end of his reign, but Damon's master must have done his job rather well. For at the age of 16, he was knighted and bestowed with the Valyrian steel sword Dark Sister by none other than King Jaehaerys himself. Damon would garner a reputation as a skilled warrior in tourney and field, but it was his fiery personality that would be his undoing most of the time, for his moods were as changeable as the flames coming off a pyre or a dragon's gullet. He was charming, to be sure, but there was an edge to his personality that made him dangerous, and his roguish behavior made him half a sellsword to the eyes of the lords and commoners alike. We can also assume that it was at 16 that he also claimed the dragon that would become as much a part of his personality as his sword, the Scarlet Dragon Karan. Caraxes, whom the dragon keepers called the Blood Worm. Caraxes' rider, Aemon Targaryen, died in 92 AC when Daemon was 11, so it is possible that a young Daemon bonded with his uncle's dragon right after his passing, but we think it's more likely that he did this after he had turned of age. Though Daemon receiving Dark Sister was a clear sign of his martial prowess, he didn't gain the station he was hoping to achieve with his skill in court because he was married to the Lady Rhea Royce in 97 AC. The match was arranged by Queen Alysanne herself, one of the final marriages she would see done in the twilight of her life, but unlike most of her arranged betrothals, this one was a failure from the start. Damon didn't like the Veil of Arryn, no more than he liked his lady wife. In one letter, he wrote of his displeasure with his marriage, claiming that in the Veil men coupled with sheep, and he couldn't fault them for their sheep, were prettier. 
In another, he called his wife his bronze bitch. There is no mention of a reason for Damon being sent away to the Vale in the first place, because it's highly unusual for a prince to accompany his lady wife to her home seat. But we can assume that this was because of the old wise saying that too many dragons in a household were as dangerous as too few. By the time in Damon had married Rhea, House Targaryen had seen many tragedies, but also seen those lost lives replaced with new ones. It was perhaps wisdom that made the old king send his grandson off with his wife, and having a dragon in the veil also ensured their continued loyalty to the Iron Throne. But he perhaps misjudged Daemon, for he was a warrior to the bone, and thought himself akin to the dragon lords of old. In later years, he would be known to have remarked to his good friend Corlys Valerian that Dark Sister was made for nobler tasks than slaughtering sheep, and he would end up proving that statement when he launched his private war. But that is still a ways off. For now, we look towards early years at court as a man, and what shaped him into said man. He can keep his tongue. Disarm him! Many. The Prince of the City and Lord Flea Bottom, Daemon Targaryen's reign in King's Landing. When Daemon got married to Rhea Royce, his grandfather Jaehaerys was 64 years old, and although he was still pretty sprightly for his age, it was evident that he was getting on and would not be bound for this world for too long. The issue of succession was bound to rise sooner rather than later, for although Prince Balon, Daemon's father, was the old king's designated heir and hand, Rhaenys Targaryen still lived and had two children one of them a son. Being the daughter of Balon's older brother Aemon, the former rider of Caraxes, Rhaenys's claim to the Iron Throne was not without support and some kind of civil strife was to be expected after the Old King's passing. But then tragedy struck sooner than anticipated and somehow Daemon Targaryen found himself in a position to be in line for the Iron Throne. His father Balon had set out for a hunting trip but returned with a burst belly, ended up taking his life. With Balon gone and Vagon an archmaester of the Citadel, Rhaenys' claim saw its star rise. Corlys Valerian gathered men and ships at Driftmark to defend their son Leonor's rights, but Prince Daemon was not far behind him. Daemon declared his support for his brother Viserys and went one step further. He gathered a small army of sworn swords and men-at-arms in anticipation of a Valerian attack, because for the first time in his life, Damon had a chance at being what he wanted to be. Viserys and his wife, their cousin Emma, had one living child of their bodies, and that was Princess Rhaenyra Targaryen. Lady Emma's pregnancy history was blotted with miscarriages, and the one time she managed to actually give birth, her baby was lost in the cradle. After Rhaenyra was born, Viserys and Emma actually stopped trying to make another child and instead doted on their daughter, likely because Emma's body would not be able to take another pregnancy. This is something Damon would have known, having been present at court for the early years of his brother's marriage. So, if Viserys won at the Great Council of 101 AC, Damon would actually become his heir until a son was born to him, and the council itself proved that a woman's claim was as good as baseless when it dismissed the pleas of Rhaenys and her daughter Lena. But this is where a rivalry must have developed between the brothers, if it didn't exist already, for though Damon coveted the title of Prince of Dragonstone, Viserys never officially bestowed it upon him. The old king passed away in 103 AC, after which Viserys ascended the throne and should have named an heir to keep the peace within the realm and his own family. Instead, he chose to delay the matter until he got a son of his own, and so Damon was left to languish in a loveless marriage. He petitioned his brother immediately after he became king for a royal annulment of his marriage to Rhea Royce, but Viserys refused him, knowing that his daughter Rhaenyra was enamoured with her uncle and deeming Daemon unfit for rule. It wasn't as if the king made his decision without any backing, for he did give his brother the chance to rule at his side. Viserys named Daemon his master of coin in 103 AC, seemingly soon after his own ascension, and allowed him to continue to stay at the royal court. Governance seemed to bore the rogue prince, however, as he was removed from his post within a year, during which time he developed a heated rivalry with Viserys's hand Otto Hightower. The king next made his brother master of laws, but was convinced by his hand to demote him to the post of commander of the city watch. He was Lord Justicia for six months. It is very likely that Viserys got the notion that Daemon was unfit for rule from Otto Hightower, given the events of the Dance of the Dragons, but we can't ignore the fact that the brothers were never set to get on well with one another in the first place, and Daemon's relationship with Rhaenyra is something Otto could have leveraged as well, because it would be rather disquieting for any father, even a Valyrian, to see his daughter get close to his ambitious and impetuous mongrel of a brother. Prince Daemon would often bring his young niece gifts from his trips across the narrow sea, a completely harmless act of affection at first glance, but given what happens in later years, it can only be thought of as grooming. 
One of the biggest mistakes that Otto Hightower made in his master plan to get his bloodline attached to the Dragon Lords was he underestimated the charisma that Damon oozed, for making him commander of the City Watch basically gave him a private army, 2,000 strong. He also had all his men outfitted with better weapons and armor and gave each of them a heavy woolen cloak dyed golden, after which the City Watch started being called the Gold Cloaks. So he lost to Sir Kristen Cole twice during the tourney arranged in honor of his brother's ascension. That didn't make the Rogue Prince any less of an inspiration. Damon inspired fierce loyalty within his men, and during his two-year-long tenure as a commander, he effectively ruled the streets of King's Landing. Crime fell sharply under his command, and the Gold Cloaks became more of a fighting force under his guidance. No man can deny that but the prince himself gained a black reputation as well. Though his men loved him, his detractors despised his brutal methods of enforcing the king's laws, and soon his reputation was split down the middle. Damon was known to every cutpurse, harlot, and gambler in King's Landing, and though he styled himself Prince of the City, men called him Lord Flea Bottom. It was during this time that he acquired the services of a certain Lycini dancer called Misaria, who would end up being associated with him far longer than his own wife. Damon Targaryen's grasp over King's Landing was so strong that only he could have loosened his grasp over it, and then he only went and did it to himself, didn't he? After his celebrations, Viserys set about seeing to the task of giving the realm an heir, and miraculously enough, Queen Emma announced that she was pregnant. The entire realm held its breath when she went into labor in 105 AC, let out shrieks of despair when Emma and her son Balon both died a day apart from each other. This tragedy broke Viserys and hardened him into naming his only living child Rhaenyra as his heir, but there was likely another reason as well. The small matter of Damon joking about his son's passing, calling Balon the heir for a day. What might have been a harmless comment, or a total fabrication, mind you, turned their relationship sour rather quickly. Damon immediately resigned as the commander of the Gold Cloaks in protest and departed for Dragonstone with his lover Missaria, top Caraxes. There, he got her with child and planned to give her a dragon's egg, but was once again stopped by his peace-obsessed big brother who was somehow king. Viserys commanded Damon to return the egg, banish his whore, and return to his lady wife in the Vale, and he obeyed his king's command, but the loss of his child through Missaria to the storms of Shipbreaker Bay hardened him against Viserys in a way he would never quite let go of. Damon was determined to prove that he was greater than his brother in every aspect and should be the rightful ruler of the Seven Kingdoms, so he decided to make an alliance with his biggest political headache, House Valerian. Less than a year after being made to return to his marriage, Damon Targaryen and Caraxes were spotted by the Triarchy sailors who were occupying the Stepstones. Those who tried to escape by sea and return with reinforcements found themselves running into Valerian sails. Thus began the War for the Stepstones in 106 AC, and a conquest Daemon Targaryen could call his own. King of the Narrow Sea and aspiring King Consort, Daemon Targaryen in the lead-up to the Dance of the Dragons. Despite having inferior numbers, Daemon and the Sea Snake's army of sellswords and adventurers had one advantage, Caraxes. Over the course of three years, Daemon and his men showered the Stepstones with the blood of their enemies, and by 109 AC, they had taken control of all but two of the Isles. Daemon had given Dark Sister the blood that she thirsted after for so long by slaying the Myrish Prince Admiral Craig Astreha in single combat and after the Sea Snake ships had secured the shipping lanes, he was proclaimed the King of the Narrow Sea and the Stepstones by Corlys himself, who put a crown upon the rogue prince's brow. Daemon and Caraxes ruled from Bloodstone over their paltry kingdom for about a year before the Triarchy responded with a Dornish alliance and a massive fleet under the Admiralty of Rakalio Rindun. Daemon and his forces brought fire and blood to their enemies for nigh on a year, and his tactics must have been spot on, for they managed to hold out against far greater numbers, but by the time 111 when AC came around, Damon had been fighting over a few paltry rocks for five years. That was not the kind of kingdom he wished to rule. The King of the Narrow Sea returned to court upon Carax's back during the tourney where the Blacks and the Greens got their names, and offered up his crown to King Viserys in reconciliation. Damon was offered a seat on the small council again, and it was hoped that exile and war would have made him wiser, but Viserys was sorely mistaken at that. Alicent and her children only served to remind Damon how far he had fallen in the line of succession so he acted cold towards them, though he was never not courteous. So Damon decided to revisit an old flame of his and advance his claim another way by wooing 
Princess Rhaenyra. Though he had reconnected with his old friends in Flea Bottom and the Streets of Silk, the heiress was the one who truly commanded his attention. He would lavish Rhaenyra with praises and gifts, including a jade tiara that had allegedly belonged to the Empress of Lang, and continuously mocked the greens in her presence. Uncle and niece would go hawking together, and took many a flight to Dragonstone and back upon Caraxes and Cyrax. But six months after his return, Damon was exiled once again, and apparently the decision involved Rhaenyra as well. Accounts differ as to what exactly happened. Some claim that Rhaenyra had been found abed with her uncle, while others claim he had given her lessons in the womanly arts to seduce Kristen Cole. Either way, it's heavily implied that something sexual occurred between Damon and Rhaenyra, because the rogue prince is known to have told his brother to give her to me. Who else will take her now? This caused Viserys to grow so wrath he exiled his brother once again. Lord Lionel Strong, the master of laws, even suggested that Damon be executed for high treason, but Viserys didn't wish to be named Kinslayer. The rogue prince returned to ruling over his kingdom, where he stayed for four years before abandoning them altogether. That was because Damon had received word of his lady wife's death and wished to take ownership of Runestone for himself, but his petitions were rejected by Lady Jane Arryn, and he was also warned to not return to the Vale, causing Damon to turn to his ally, the Sea Snake, instead. Damon arrived at Driftmark, and was immediately taken with Corlys's daughter, Lena Valerian. Some say it was love at first sight, while others say it was a means to check his descent from power, but all tales agree that Corlys agreed with the match. The only problem was Lena had been betrothed to the son of the Sea Lord of Bravos since she was twelve, and he had turned up at Driftmark after floundering away his father's wealth. Corliss had tried to get rid of him gracefully for a decade, but when he couldn't do so, Damon slew two birds with one stroke of the sword for him. He provoked the Sea Lord's son so much that he received a challenge to a duel, and then he promptly murdered his opponent with Dark Sister. Lena and Damon were wed a fortnight later. Knowing that the marriage would tick off his brother Viserys, Damon took his bride east on a honeymoon tour of sorts. Caraxes and Vagar were spotted at Pentos, Volantis, Quahar and Norvas. When the married couple arrived at Pentos once again, Lena discovered that she was pregnant, and so they stayed there for a while, under the patronage of the Prince of Pentos. It was in that free city that Damon's twin daughters, Baylar and Reynar Targaryen, were born. He stayed at Pentos with his family for half a year, after which they returned to Driftmark, with Damon leading Caraxes and Vagar home. Once he was back in the Seven Kingdoms, he wrote his brother the King, begging leave to present his daughters at court for a royal blessing, and while the small council urged him to ignore Ignore the request, Viserys agreed, reasoning that fatherhood would have changed Damon. During his residence at High Tide, Damon and his wife became quite close to his niece, Rhaenyra. The couple would visit the princess at Dragonstone, and she would in turn visit them at High Tide. Lena and Rhaenyra would often go flying together on their dragons, and their closeness culminated in the betrothal of Damon's daughters to Rhaenyra's eldest sons, Jace and Luke. Four years did the rogue prince spend in a marriage that appeared to be as fruitful as it was happy. That tragedy struck House Valerian in one. 20 AC, also known as the Year of the Red Spring. Lena Valerian had discovered that she was pregnant again in 119 AC and was due the next year, but certain complications arose during the birth. After laboring for a day and a night, she brought forth a twisted and malformed child who didn't survive for too long. Lena's strength had fled her body and childbed fever set in. She died a few days later, trying to reach Vagar in her final moments, but collapsing on the steps. Damon carried her body back to her bed himself, where he stood vigil alongside Rhaenyra. It is here that the story story must once again take a lewd turn, and trust us when we say we don't want it to. The situation between Damon and Rhaenyra had gone unaddressed for years by this point, but it was seemingly not over yet. Shortly after Lena's death, her brother Lenor was murdered by his companion, lover, Sir Qual Cory, in Spice Town. Cory disappeared after the killing, and this also left Rhaenyra, a widow, opening up a path for her to marry the uncle she had been enamored with for literally years. And guess what? She did exactly that, shocking the realm and enraging her father at the same time. The third marriage of Daemon Targaryen was as scandalous as his second, for neither Laenor nor Laenor had been dead for six months when it occurred. It was clear that the rogue prince had made the most of his bedding as well, for Rhaenyra welcomed their first son Aegon into the world later that very year. Because of the head-spinning rate at which things occurred, many people accused Daemon of killing not one but three people during the year of the Red Spring. The first was obviously Carl Corrie, whom people believed Daemon had hired so he could finally marry 
Ari Rhaenyra. The other two were the deaths of Lionel and Harwin Strong, with the reasoning being that Damon wanted to remove all rivals for Rhaenyra's affection from this world. Both are valid arguments, and given the rogue prince's reputation, highly likely as well. But since they were never proven, we can never confirm his involvement. What we can confirm is that Damon welcomed another son by Rhaenyra in 122 AC, named Viserys for his brother and her father, and that he was willing to stick up for his stepsons as well. When the sea snake fell ill in 126 AC, it was feared that he would die. Rhaenyra urged him to name her second son Lucerys as the heir to Driftmark. Her proposition was challenged by Corlys' oldest nephew, Vaemon Valerian, who protested on the grounds that Luke was a bastard fathered by Harwin Strong. Though the histories tell us that the princess was the one who ordered Vaemon beheaded and fed to her dragon, knowing Prince Damon's personality, it was more likely that he simply relieved the seahorse knight of his head by his own volition. It appears as though Damon was aware of the possibility of war before his brother, but when the dance finally came, he was the one most prepared to meet it. The Rogue Prince and the One-Eyed Prince the last chapter of Daemon Targaryen's life. When Dragonstone received word of King Viserys' death and Prince Aegon's subsequent coronation, Daemon was present. His wife, Rhaenyra, went into a black rage after receiving the news and went into premature labor, producing a stillborn daughter she named Visenya. Daemon's reaction to the loss of his daughter is not known, but what is known is that he plunged himself into the war. Otto Hightower had convinced the Green Council that Daemon would be a second Maegor the Cruel and that he and Rhaenyra would turn the Red Keep into a brothel, but the rogue princess first actions during the war efforts state otherwise. It was Daemon Targaryen who advised his wife to court the support of the great houses that had not declared for Aegon yet. The rogue prince also identified the Riverlands as the key to the war effort given its central location and fertile lands, and he was proven right in that as well. We know from the War of the Five Kings that he who held the Riverlands held the key to winning the war, despite the country itself suffering all the consequences of warfare. Besides, if the Riverlords declared for Rhaenyra, it wouldn't be long before all the great houses above the Neck did so as well and the allegiance of the Crownlands were already with her. Damon was clearly far more experienced at the art of war than his lady wife, which is presumably why no one objected when he effectively took the position of commander-in-chief of the royal forces for himself. When Sir Stephen Darklin arrived at Dragonstone with the crown that Jaehaerys and Viserys had donned during their reigns, he crowned Rhaenyra himself and proclaimed her Queen of the Andals, the Rhoynar, and the First Men, whilst declaring himself protector of the realm. Shortly after this, Damon assaulted Harrenhal by himself, landing Caraxes atop Kingspire Tower and ensuring a bloodless surrender of the castle. This move inspired the Riverlands to stand up for Rhaenyra and the diplomatic efforts of her son Jace secured her the support of the Vale and the North. Damon also managed to draw first blood from the Greens when he captured Stone Hedge from the Brackens after the Battle of the Burning Mill. But it was the act he ordered in the memory of his slain stepson Lucerys give you a sense of just how grey George R. R. Martin's world is. Writing to his wife from Harrenhal, Damon had pledged an eye for an eye, a son for a son, and his work was done by two men known to history as Blood and Cheese, whom he employed through his former lover, Misaria. As it so happens, Misaria had established a network of spies in the capital and seemingly kept in touch with Damon after the deeds of Blood and Cheese were done, but the rogue prince received word of his enemy's next move as soon as they'd made it. Lord Commander, Kristen Cole, and Prince Emin Targaryen had assembled a host to challenge Damon in the field, so he decided to abandon his position and take the real prize of the war instead, King's Landing. When Damon had claimed said prize, his old friend and father by law, Corlys, Valerian urged the royal couple to offer pardons to their enemies and create peace for the realm. But Damon was not ready to offer any ground to the Greens. The war will end when the traitors' heads are mounted on spikes above the king's gate and not before, is what he told the sea snake. And so the war continued onward. Damon was dispatched by his wife, Queen Rhaenyra, to take care of Emond One-Eye, who would become the terror of the trident to stride Vagar, and he obeyed his queen by taking the dragon seed nettles along with him. But this is where the last chapter of Damon's life begins, for it was not long after this that rumors began to spread about his relationship with the skinny brown girl. Though Maester Norrin, who was observing Damon and Nettles in real time at Maidenpool, noted that they seemed to share a father-daughter relationship, his former paramour convinced Rhaenyra otherwise. Freshly betrayed by Ulf the White and Hugh Hammer, Rhaenyra ordered the execution of all the dragon seeds her late son Jace had gathered in her support, including Nettles. When Norrin brought Damon the letter Rhaenyra had sent Lord Manfred Mouton regarding Nettles' fate, he thanked the maester for his assistance and had a tearful farewell with Nettles the 
next morning before announcing that he was going to wait for his terror of a nephew at Arenhall. Damon's arrival atop Caraxes scared the squatters away, and thus began his vigil. For 13 nights did he wait for Amond and Vagar to show up in the skies above Black Heron's Folly, and each night that he did not appear, Damon would leave a slash on the heart tree of the godswood. It is said that the 13 slashes bleed afresh every spring when weirwood sap seeps through them, for on the 14th night, Amon Targaryen arrived mounted atop Vagar. Uncle and nephew had a short, brusque conversation where both of them agreed that the former had lived longer than he was required to, and after preparing for battle, they both took to the skies. The following conflict was perhaps the most spectacular and most damaging one in the entire Dance of the Dragons. Vagar was twice as big as Caraxes, but the Bloodworm was thrice as fierce and in his prime besides. Their clash was one that the Dragon Lords of Old Valyria would have been proud of witnessing, for it was the closest thing to an even fight in the history of dragon conflicts in Westeros. In the end, it came down to their riders to close the battle above the god's eye, and Daemon Targaryen's most glorious moment in life was perhaps also his last. Locked by their dragons mid-air, Prince Daemon leapt from his saddle, dark sister in hand, and thrust the sword hilt first into his nephew's eye. When Emin Targaryen's body was recovered years later, the sword was still lodged in his eye socket. As for Prince Daemon himself, well, we'll discuss that a bit later. But for now, let's get to his depiction in House of the Dragon, and how it's both the closest and the farthest this thing from the books. Will the Rogue Prince survive? Daemon Targaryen's Legacy and House of the Dragon In many ways, Daemon Targaryen is the only character who's exactly like his Fire and Blood counterpart when you consider all the changes that the showrunners made to the rest of the cast. But in others, he's completely different. For starters, his feud with Viserys is far more prominent in the show. Whenever Targaryens have had too many heirs for their own good, they've tended to either hold them close or send them far, far away. Maegor the Cruel had served his brother Ennis as Hand of the King, and Daemon's father Bale had served as hand for Jaehaerys himself. Turns out, Cho Daemon was expecting the same thing, but he never got it. Neither did he get the title of Prince of Dragonstone, something that was, at the time, his right. Daemon loves his brother Viserys, but seems vexed by his weakness. He tells him things as they truly are, and wants to help protect him from himself. But while his words might speak of support, his actions spoke otherwise. And as the saying goes, actions speak louder than words. The ambiguity of Daemon and Rhaenyra's relationship doesn't exist in the show. It is very very clearly a grooming situation. They decide to make one of Mushroom's tales canon in episode 4 when Daemon takes Rhaenyra for a night out and she ends up sleeping with Kristen Cole, but even there, the spectre of Viserys is always looming. Daemon is obsessed with the fact that his weak prophecy adhering brother doesn't acknowledge him with unbiased love and pours over histories of dragon lords over and over again, but refuses to admit that he wants reconciliation. At every turn where he could have diffused a situation, he chooses to escalate it. And when Whenever you think Damon seems settled and happy, he surprises you with an especially distasteful mean streak that Matt Smith makes you forget is the core of his personality. Damon Targaryen didn't raise his daughters in Pentos, and he did not show Baylor partiality over Rhaena, though this might have been possible. This happened in the show because of his complicated relationship with his brother and the fact that time skips were a necessary thing. Another thing that is quite different in House of the Dragon is Damon's involvement in the three deaths that he was accused of in Fire and Blood. While he was not at all involved, Involved in the deaths of Lionel and Harwin Strong, he was involved in the death of Lionel Valerian, just not in the way you think. The TV show has taken the interesting approach of setting Lionel free instead of having him killed. This will have grave consequences during the sowing of the dragon seeds because, as you might know by now, a dragon only accepts one ride at a time and can only take another when the current one is dead. Leaving Lionel alive is a plot thread that we hope won't become a retcon in later seasons, just as we hope that the reigniting of Damon's rivalry with Rhaenyra Nera will not disappoint. Though we don't hear of any such thing occurring in Fire and Blood, there is a clear opposing dynamic between the two in House of the Dragon, which has newly resurfaced following their disagreement on their war strategy. Another thing that we didn't know before the show is that Damon has a beautiful set of pipes on him, but that's a cosmetic discussion, if anything. The crazy thing is that despite making so many revisions to his character's trajectory and portrayal, Matt Smith's Damon Targaryen still feels like Martin's rogue prince. His swagger, the way he casually 
usually beats up an innocent messenger, the menacing aura he has when he tests the loyalty of Stefan Darklin and Laurent Marbrand. It's all consistent with the person that we've read about for years, and that is where the true joy in his depiction lies. Damon Targaryen's legacy with the viewers of the show will line up precisely with Archmaester Gildane's assessment of his character. But given the fact that House of the Dragon is okay with making bold canonical decisions with regards to the fates of its characters, we're left wondering how Damon's story will end. This is because in Fire and Blood, after his clash with Aemond, the bodies of all parties involved are recovered and carried back to the Red Keep except Damon's. His body is never found, and this has led people to believe that he escaped with the girl Nettles to spend his final days in the Mountains of the Moon. If that is indeed the case, then Game of Thrones is even lamer than it already is in our opinion, because they literally dropped the plot point of a dragon rising from the east, something the books have been talking about since the 90s, and we don't know how we will react to that revelation, honestly. But we guess that's why we're watching the show, isn't it? Or, more accurately, I am. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone.